We host this lecture usually every other year um, in collaboration with the League of Women Voters of Lancaster County, and so we are thrilled to um, be able to be partners in this event. By the way, if you aren't registered to vote, don't leave tonight without doing so. There are tables in the back, and you can make that happen before you leave. So please take advantage of that opportunity. We're pleased this year to host the Kennerdine Lecture as part of the International Policy Conference, which has been going on the last two days on the theme, Justice for All. And I want to extend my sincere appreciation to those who participated in the planning of today's event. Susan Leinberger, I saw you here. Um, Cheryl Desmond is right here. Fran Rodriguez is here in the front. We'll meet her later. Uh, Teresa Russell Loretz, I also saw you here somewhere in the audience. So thank you. Thank you all. And I also want to acknowledge the work of David Ramsey, uh, my assistant who deals with lots and lots of logistics and who does a wonderful job of creating publicity for these events. So thank you, DJ. I want to acknowledge also Audrey Lopez and Carrie Hussein for their assistance in organizing the session earlier today on immigration and voter access. And I think they're here in the audience as well. Thank you, Audrey and Carrie. And Cheryl hosted um, a table here this afternoon on her organization. Um, and so thank you, Cheryl. The name of your organization? Sarah. Sarah. Okay, so you can learn more about that from Cheryl. It's an election season. We really um, can't get away from it uh, these days. Uh, no matter where you are, whether it's uh, driving um, and there are signs on sidewalks or anywhere in the media, there's lots and lots of focus on the election. And so we have an intriguing evening ahead for us this evening. Um, we will hear from Danny Hayes regarding his research on women and who are running for office. Um, and after Danny's uh, presentation, what we will do next is we will have a set of respondents. Uh, we have a distinguished panel who will be um, introduced later, and we're so pleased that they are here. Um, and then after they have an opportunity to interact around the issues that resonate with them, we'll open up the floor for some questions. Following that, Danny's going to be available back there at the table to autograph books if you're interested in picking up his latest. Um, and if you're a student here, we invite you to give us um, feedback. And so Alex, where are you? Here he is. Alex has feedback forms uh, for students to give us feedback on this session. So please uh, feel free. Uh, sit back. Get ready. Uh, we're going to um, start on a journey about um, women and politics. In the next few moments, I'm going to invite Fran Rodriguez to the podium. She will introduce our speaker and also say just a few words about who in the world was Harriet Kenderdine, um, the person who, for whom this lecture is named. Thank you all for coming. Fran? Good evening. Thank you, Diane, for this great introduction. And congratulations, by the way, on yesterday's One Day Give. The university raised $123,630 for student scholarships. Bravo. I'm actually getting ready for a little give day myself. The Extraordinary Give is scheduled on Friday, November 18th. Anyone interested in participating in Lancaster County's largest day of online giving can participate by going on to extragive.org. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Lancaster County, welcome to the 2016 Harriet Kenderdine Lecture. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. It influences public policy through education and advocacy. 
we never support or oppose any political party or candidate. Since my appointment as president of the League in May of 2015, I've worked intentionally to engage young women and men to serve this important organization. Our work goes beyond learning about candidates and election day. Membership information can be found on the table in the back, and we encourage you to become a member, especially the young students, young, young adults in the room. Your voices are often missing at our tables, whether it's in a boardroom or in decision-making circles. We need you, and I'm hoping that many of you will become engaged on November 8th because your voice is very necessary in the election. Civic engagement was a major part of Harriet Kenderdine's life, but she was best known for her work with the League of Women Voters of Lancaster County. From 1950 to 1960, Harriet held leadership roles within the local and state leagues. From 1962 to 1966, she served on the National Board of the League of Women Voters and served as chair of the Foreign Policy Committee. Her passion and commitment to citizens across the world was clear during her time as a United Nations advisor. When Harriet Webb Kenderdine died in September 1982, she left a legacy to the League of Women Voters that became the Kenderdine Lecture and is now a long-standing partnership we share with Millersville University. In addition to her contributions to the League, Harriet was deeply interested in Latin American affairs. She maintained leadership positions within the Committee on Cultural Relations with Latin America in New York City and the Inter-American Seminar on Social and Political Problems in Washington, D.C. In keeping with Harriet Kenderdine's le legacy, I'm delighted for tonight's lecture and dialogue. Following the lecture, we're gonna have some animated conversation, and I'm hoping that the young adults, again in the room, I'm gonna keep mentioning you, that you become engaged, that you ask us questions, because we need you. I cannot emphasize that more. So, let's get started. The 2016 Kenderdine guest lecturer, Dr. Danny Hayes, is Associate Professor of Political Science at George Washington University and a fellow at the Women and Politics Institute at American University. He has co-authored two books. Of great interest for this evening's lecture is Women on the Run, Gender, Media, and Political Campaigns in a Polarized Era. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Danny Hayes. Um, thank you to all of you, uh, and thank you to Dean Umble and to Fran for that uh, introduction. Um, uh, I realize that I have the unusual distinction of being a person from Washington, D.C. who came to Pennsylvania this month and is not stumping for a presidential candidate. <laughs> um, uh, I hope tonight to give you a brief, brief respite from the presidential campaign, though of course the presidential campaign uh, I acknowledge I have to talk about it a little bit, but this isn't really a talk about uh, the presidential campaign. Um, I'm honored to be, able to be here and to talk to you a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing over the last few years to try to understand uh, what happens when women run for office in the United States. And if we're going to talk about uh, women running for office in the United States, um, of course, we have to talk about our presidential candidates. So we're going to talk about the presidential race. Now, Hillary Clinton, of course, if she wins on November 8th, uh, will become the first woman to hold the presidency in the United States. Um, that will, of course, be a, a momentous achievement. It will be a historic moment uh, if it happens uh, on the order of uh, electing the first African-American president as the United States did in 2008. Um, and most of our discussions today about women in politics focus on Hillary Clinton, and they focus on the presidency because, in her words, it is that highest, hardest glass ceiling. But what I want to suggest tonight and what I'm going to focus on is that women's underrepresentation in the United States extends far beyond the presidency. If Hillary Clinton becomes uh, the first woman to hold the office, uh, she will change the percentage of men who have hold the, held the office from 100% to 98%. Um, it's an achievement, but it also should highlight that women are underrepresented in politics in, in ways that are 
that go well beyond the presidency. And if you look at the graph up here, um, oh, well, you can, there's some color problems. But what you can see is that on the, um, on the left side shows you the percentage of women who hold political office in the United States Senate, in the US House, as governors, as state legislators, uh, and as mayors of the 100 biggest cities in the United States. 20% uh, of the US Senate is women, 19% of the US House. You can see that the numbers don't really get much bigger when we go down to local offices. On the other hand, of course, men hold three quarters to 80% of uh, those seats. Now, we might look at this and say, OK, this doesn't seem to be representing half of the population. If half of the population is women, and women only constitute 20 to 25% of our elected officials, right, that's not great. But maybe it's the case that the United States isn't any different than other countries. But in fact, if we look at other countries, we see that the United States lags far behind. And the US lags far behind many of our comparable countries, such as Cuba, who we typically compare ourselves to. That's a joke, right? <laughs> um, if you look at this ranking, this is a percentage of women who hold seats in the national legislatures in these um, various <coughs> countries. The, top, the 10 countries at the top that you see are the countries that have the highest percentage of women in their uh, national legislature, Rwanda being the top one. Uh, I can't, because of the limits of PowerPoint, thanks a lot, Bill Gates, I can't show you all 95, or all 94 countries that come before the United States, but the United States is 95th on that list with 19% of our Congress made up of women. Now, as many of you probably know, the reason that some of these countries have more women in office is because they have what are, what are called gender quotas. That is, a certain number of seats in the national legislature are actually set aside for women, which, of course, we don't have in the United States. Um, but nonetheless, this doesn't seem to portray the United States in a very favorable light when it comes to uh, gender equality um, uh, in politics. So this raises the question, why is it that in the United States there are so few women in political office? Uh, as with any good social science question, there's more than one answer. Um, and political scientists have focused on a number of different factors that lead women to be significantly underrepresented in the United States. Um, one is what are referred to as structural barriers. The main, one of the main impediments to women holding elective office in the United States is that there are so many men in office now. And as a, those of you who are political science majors um, probably know, it's very difficult to defeat incumbents, that is, people who hold office at the time. And because women have only had the right to vote at the federal level for less than 100 years, and because women have only been running for office in significant numbers for about 30 or 40 years, any increase in women's representation is likely to be slow, in part because most of the people who are incumbents, the most difficult people to defeat in an election, are men. And so it's unlikely that there will be more than incremental gains in any given election cycle. And so that structural factor, at least now, right, certainly um, limits the rise in the number of women who might hold office in the, the United States. Um, there are also what are referred to as situational factors. One of the most prominent here is that for many decades, women were significantly underrepresented, not just in politics, but in the careers that often led people to launch a bid for political office. Women were, there were many fewer women who were lawyers, business people, uh, educators in the highest echelons of education. Those are often what are referred to as the pipeline professions. And since women, for reasons having to do with the labor force and women being less likely to actually uh, go to graduate school and achieve the degrees that were needed to get into those professions, they were less likely to be positioned to run in the first place. That has, of course, begun to change, though, in the last couple of decades. Now, actually, more women go to law school than do men. And so that factor is starting to be removed as a barrier to women holding office. But I think one of the most common explanations for why women are underrepresented in the United States is often what's referred to as either bias or discrimination. And uh, the focus on this is usually in the context of political campaigns. Um, the argument being that social stereotypes of women, or what are often referred to as gender stereotypes, lead the media and voters to treat female candidates less fairly than they treat male candidates. 
We can all come up with examples of this. Sarah Palin having to ask, answer questions during her candidacy as vice president in 2008 about her wardrobe and how much her wardrobe costs. Uh, and one of the ways in which this is often argued to manifest itself is that voters perceive female candidates as caring and perhaps possessing integrity, but are less likely to see them as strong, competent leaders. Traits that voters often say that they want in their political leaders, especially in the highest political offices. So if these stereotypes about women that lead voters to take them less seriously as candidates and perhaps lead the media to treat them more superficially or as less serious candidates, then this might create an environment during the campaign that makes it harder for women to succeed. It might make voters less likely to, to vote for them, and it might create a media environment that proves to be an obstacle, and an obstacle that men don't necessarily have to overcome. And so this is a common argument. You can find examples of this argument pretty easily. After Hillary Clinton lost the Democratic nomination in 2008 to Barack Obama, Katie Couric, uh, the journalist, said that one of the lessons of the Clinton campaign is the continued and accepted role of sexism in American life, particularly in the media. Kirk went on to explain that she thought that one of the reasons that Clinton lost the race was because the media coverage of her was sexist, and that Obama was treated differently because he was a man. Kirk is not alone in claiming that bias is an impediment for women. Michelle Bachman, the former representative uh, in the House from Minnesota, presidential candidate in 2012, on the Republican side, said in an interview in February of 2014 that many voters simply aren't ready for a female president. That in fact, bias among voters and a preference for men would make it difficult for Hillary Clinton or any other woman to win. Now, of course, you might read this as an implicit criticism of Hillary Clinton, since Michelle Bachman is no, fa no fan of Hillary Clinton, and I think indeed it was. But I think this is a prevailing sentiment. Oops. Hmm, my clicker doesn't seem to work. I think, it, you know why? It's because I made that crack about Bill Gates. It's his revenge. Look at that. An example closer to home, for those of you here in Pennsylvania, Alison Swartz, who ran for governor, ran for the Democratic nomination of, uh, uh, for governor in Pennsylvania in 2014, uh, claimed after she lost that it was because she was a woman. The political pundits, the media, the Harrisburg establishment couldn't believe a woman could serve as governor. They couldn't even imagine it. And thus, they treated her unfairly and they treated her in a way that made it difficult for her to win. Finally, my favorite example, of course, America's most famous politi female politician, <laughs> Julia Louis-Dreyfus, the star and hero of Veep. Don't say anything, I'm only on like the fourth episode, so I don't want any spoilers, right, for those of you who've watched all the way through, but I like it so far. Uh, told Vanity Fair in an interview in 2015 that one of the storylines of, of Veep, the show that she's a star of on HBO, was born of her view about the way that women in politics are treated. She said, I, I was fascinated by how people are so judgmental about how women look, and male politicians don't get that, and I cleaned it up. You're welcome. Right? <laughs> she didn't say stuff. A change of hairstyle often gets more attention than the legislation that they're trying to put forth. Right? So I, I think all of these examples capture in different ways uh, the conventional wisdom about the experience that women face when they run and the impediments that may lead women to be underrepresented. That is, things that happen on the campaign trail that make it difficult for women to get elected, that reduce voters' likelihood of voting for them, and that this helps explain why there aren't very many women in political office. I'm gonna to suggest to you to, to, tonight that while that is true, the views that of these prominent people, or I'm gonna to suggest to you that while there is some truth to the, that argument, the views of those prominent people, as well as the views of the public, in many cases, are not in keeping with the reality of what happens when women run. Uh, in 2014, my co-author Jennifer Lawless and I uh, conducted some surveys, nationally representative surveys of Americans, and asked them their view about, um, about like, the experiences that women face when they run and what the barriers were to women getting elected. Um, as you can see from this chart, uh, almost 60% of Americans agreed that both the media focused too much on female candidates' appearance that women are subjected to sexist media coverage when they run, that women must be more qualified than men if they are actually to win. The idea being that if an equally qualified man and woman run against each other, the, men is, the man is likely to win. And only if a woman is actually more qualified will she win. 
that women are likely to face bias from voters, that women simply don't win as often as men when they do run, and that they're likely to raise less money than our men. These perceptions are widespread. And now Bill Gates is really getting me. Um, and, and, and what I want to say, I want to be, be clear about this. I think there, there, is, there is truth to a lot of these claims. Women have to deal with things on the campaign trail that men do not. Just ask Hillary Clinton. Ask Hillary Clinton about the things that she is told that go on at rallies for Donald Trump. Many of you have seen in news reports some of the misogynist and sexist things that are said about Hillary Clinton. Women who run at every level of office sometimes have to put up with things that men do not. And so I want to be clear that the argument that I'm making tonight is not that sexism doesn't exist or that women don't experience sexism. The question is, is the sexism that women experience on the campaign trail, does that turn out to be an impediment to their election? Is that a source of bias, of systematic bias against women that makes it harder for them to actually win votes? And there is some reason to suggest that the, that the arguments that are often made about this might not be right. That is, they might have been right 20 or 30 years ago. But that American politics may have changed in ways that make it so that the campaign trail itself is not the impediment that it once was for women running for office. And I'm going to offer you three reasons that this might be. One is that compared to attitudes, of course, in the 1950s and 1960s, but even compared to the Americans' attitudes about women in society and women in politics more specifically, currently, Americans are, have much more favorable views to the notion of women running for office. And it's almost universal that Americans say that if their party nominated a well-qualified nominee for president, if it was a woman, that would they vote for them? This is a chart that shows you Americans' responses to that question that's been asked by the Gallup organization since the 1940s. If your party nominated a well-qualified woman, would you be willing to vote for them? And what you can see is that, of course, in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, even up into the 1980s, those numbers were not especially high. But by the time we've reached 2016, almost all Americans say that they would. Now, of course, there's two caveats to any data like this. One is that Maybe people say that because they know they're supposed to say that, and they don't want to tell a pollster that they wouldn't. And so that's a reasonable question to ask. But of course, also some of this is people responding to the fact that Hillary Clinton is likely to be a candidate, right? And so these responses have to be taken in the context that many people are thinking about Clinton herself. Nonetheless, there has clearly been an increase in the percentage of voters in the United States who believe that women are qualified to hold the presidency and, by inference, other offices. It's different than the way that it was in the 1970s and 1980s. I'm not even going to try this anymore. Maybe I should just, I can update the computer and we can watch that happen. That'll be fun. <laughs> A second thing that has changed that is different than I think the circumstances that many women faced when they ran in the 1970s and 80s is that women simply aren't novelties the way that they were 20 or 30 years ago. How would this matter? Well, for one thing, it might make the media treat candidates differently if they view them as novelties. One thing that journalists love above all is something that is new. And they devote particular kinds of attention to candidates who are different than previous candidates. It's hard for me to think of an example from this cycle, but I, I bet I could come up with one <laughs> if I tried. But from the perspective of the media and the way that they might treat female candidates, in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, when women were starting to run in large numbers for the first time, there was a tendency for the media to cover them first as women running for office and secondarily as politicians. But in an era in which women have been normalized, in politics, in which we have hundreds of congressional candidates who are women running every election cycle, in which we've had a female Speaker of the House, in which it's possible that a woman might win the presidency. The landscape is very different in the way that the media treat women who run, and the way that voters might perceive them might be different than it once was. Barbara Mikulski, the senator from your neighboring state of Maryland, who's retiring this year after a long career in the Senate, talked about when she ran in her first statewide campaign in 1986, when she won the Senate seat that she currently holds. 
They said I couldn't win. They said no woman could win statewide. They said it just isn't done. But we've reached a point in American politics now where it is done. It's done all the time. And it's not unusual for journalists or voters to encounter women running for office. Combined with these more favorable attitudes that Americans have toward women in politics, the fact that they're no longer novelties might make the media more inclined to treat them first as politicians and only secondarily as women and voters to see them the same way. But perhaps the biggest change that has happened that might make the political landscape more favorable for women is the fact that we are now basically divided into competing teams. And so this is where I get to use my Red Sox and Yankees analogy. The bitter fights between Reds, the Red Sox and the Yankees, illustrated here, are very much like the fights that we now have in politics between Republicans and Democrats. As the Republican and Democratic parties have ideologically polarized, moved farther apart, adopted different stances on a whole host of issues, <coughs> it's become more and more important to Americans whether or not a candidate has an R or a D next to their name, and probably less important whether or not a candidate has a Y chromosome. And in that context, a candidate's sex, whether they're a man or a woman, is likely to matter much less to a voter than in an era in which party identification or party affiliation told them a lot less about candidates, which was true in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, almost anything that voters want to know about a candidate can be told by their party identification. I don't mean to suggest that that's all voters care about, although there's a lot of evidence that that's mostly what voters care about. But what it means is that there is less attention, there is a less likelihood that other characteristics of the candidate are going to matter as much in a partisan election when you have polarization that is at the heights that it is today. And so thinking about this lands changing landscape is what led my co-author, Jennifer Lawless, and I to think about trying to write a book and do a research project that would allow us to determine what happens when women actually run for office. And so that's why we wrote came to write the book that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about now. Um, and because I found this piece of clip art, you can know that it's a hot deal. Right? Um, <laughs> um, we were motivated to do something that we thought had been lacking in the, in the political science literature on this topic, which was to simply take a broad look across a wide variety of races at what happens when women actually run for office. And we decided not to study the presidency where a lot of research has been done, in part because it's difficult to draw systematic inferences from studies of small numbers of candidates who in their own ways are quite unique. I think we can learn a lot about the challenges that face women in politics by thinking about the experiences of Hillary Clinton. But there's a limit to what we can learn, in part because no other candidate is Hillary Clinton. She is like no other candidate, not only in terms of the long public ser time in public service she spent, but she's also the spouse of a former president who's been Secretary of State, who served in the Senate, who's just a very different character. And so what we wanted to do in this book was actually study races that look a lot more like the more mundane elections that characterize the vast majority of American politics. There are more than 500,000 elective offices in the United States. And only about 500 of them are for federal office. And that's where women's underrepresentation matters as much as anywhere. So what we tried to do was to design a study that would allow us to look at what happens in these races that aren't presidential contests, that aren't these um, uh, races that get all of the attention that we're used to. And so what we decided to do was close this out again. I think I should take it a cue is that, is that when, when this pops up, it just means that I've been talking too long. I should speed things up. Um, so what we decided to do was to look at U.S. House races um, in the 2010 and 2014 midterms. And one of the advantages of looking at U.S. House races is that House races look a lot like the many other thousands of elections that take place across the country in terms of how intense the campaigns are, in terms of how much media coverage they get. And so they allow us to generalize in a way that it's hard to do with higher profile studies of higher profile races. The other advantage of looking at House races is that there are a lot of candidates running. In the 2010 and 2014 midterms, we were able to look at the campaigns of about 1,500 candidates, almost 300 of whom are women. 
And so that gives us a large uh, empirical base to generalize from, to draw conclusions about what happens when women run. And I'm going to describe the results of two parts of our study. One part of our study involved looking at more than 10,000 news articles that were published about the candidates in their local papers in the congressional district where they ran. We chose the largest circ circulating newspaper in each congressional district for both years and did a detailed analysis of all of the news coverage in the last, last month of the campaign about the candidates. What this allowed us to do was to track the number of times that the media mentioned a candidate's gender, the media mentioned a candidate's family, their appearance, the way they covered the issues that the candidates talked about, and the way they covered their personal traits or their personal attributes. And the advantage of doing this is that it allows us to look at those markers of gender stereotyping that have often been argued to prove to be barriers to female candidates. It allows us to compare the coverage that female candidates get to the coverage that male candidates get and determine whether there are differences in the experiences that male and female candidates have in the media when they run for office. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the results that we found by looking at whether a candidate's gender, me media coverage that referred to a candidate at running as a woman, referring to their family or their appearance. Um, when we think about appearance, of course, we have to think about the pantsuit issue. Right? This is, I think, you know, sort of like the symbolic idea about what happens when women run for office. Is it like, the way that Hillary Clinton has had to deal with media, the media's obsession with her mini pantsuits to the point now that there are, you know, like you can go, if you put Hillary Clinton pantsuit into Google image search, you will just, you will go down the rabbit hole and you will spend days there and it's great. Right? This is the one that I chose. I like this one the best. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that we want to investigate. Do, do women, when they run for office, do they get more attention to their clothes than do men who are running? Bill Gates says no. <laughs> and so do we. Um, as it turned out, looking across these more than 10,000 news stories, we found very little evidence that the media ever pay attention to the kinds of things that we think of as, as sort of representative kinds of coverage of women. Um, let me just give you one example. When we counted up all of the references to a candidate's gender, which included all of the references to their family and to their appearance, running as a woman, whatever, like th think of all the things that might be markers of gender. We found that on average, across 30 days worth of coverage in the newspaper, the candidates got a mention like that only once on average across these 800 plus house races that we looked at. What's more is that it wasn't more frequent for women than it was men. That difference between the two, between the bars, is not statistically significant. It's basically the same for men and women. In particular, when we looked at specific references to family and their appearance, we found that there were very few of each. And they weren't more frequent for women. What did mentions of appearance look like when they happened? We have two really good examples, one of which involves Democratic Congressman Jim McDermott from Washington State, who for some reason during his campaign in 2010 decided to go to a museum dressed like this. <laughs> when, you're in a, when you're a member of Congress who's been in Congress for like, I think he's been in Congress for like 110 years, you can do this because your seat is safe. Slightly less safe was Blake Farenthold, a Republican member from Texas who didn't go to a museum dressed in an odd way, though several news stories of his race in 2014 involved a discussion of pictures that had surfaced of him earlier in his life where he was wearing my jammies. Right. There were, of course, stories about women's appearance as well. But what we found is that they weren't any more frequent. And men received this kind of coverage just as did women which should remind us that for all of the mentions of Hillary Clinton's pantsuits, there's probably a mention of how orange Donald Trump is and whether he looks like a Shetland pony. Okay. Now, this is not to say that what we should hope for in American politics is that the media spend a lot of time focusing on male candidates' appearance so as to even it out with the amount that they spend on female candidates' appearance, right? But what it suggests to us is that I think one of the reasons that we often think about references to 
female candidates' appearance as being so frequent is because so much of our experience is, um, is remembering the things that seem offensive. When men have this, when, when, when men are recovered this way, I think often people don't think about it in the same way that it is not as offensive as it is for, for men. It's not to say that it's not offensive to women, it is. And it's offensive to men too. But I think we remember the instances with women more than we do men. But if we look systematically, it turns out that there, don't, there aren't big differences. Oops, now I'm really. The second thing we looked at was whether coverage for female candidates was more likely to focus on their personalities than for men. And spoiler alert, lots of the graphs that I'm going to show you are going to look very similar to what I just showed you, which is that in both 2010 and 2014, there was no evidence that women get more coverage focused on their personalities as opposed to the issues that they wanted to talk about than are men, which is one of the arguments that's been made. But the way in which news coverage might actually um, disadvantage female candidates. Uh, we looked at all kinds of specific traits. These are all examples of traits that were talked about. Competence, leadership, empathy, integrity, and whether they were covered in a positive or negative way. You don't need to try to parcel all of these things which are difficult to see, but the story is that there's very little difference. And in fact, the small differences that we found in a few cases seem to suggest that women were getting more favorable coverage than were men. What happens when we looked at the way the candidates' issue positions were covered? Again, what we found is very little difference. Women were just as likely to get coverage of the issues that they wanted to talk about. In fact, they were slightly more likely to get substantive coverage. And across a variety of topics, whether we're talking about crime, whether we're talking about national security, issues that, are, that women are often seen as disadvantaged on, the media didn't devote any less attention to those issues for women as they did for men. There just weren't any kind of major differences. So when we looked at news coverage in general, what we found was just basically similarity between male candidates and female candidates and the kind of coverage that they received. What about the way that voters perceived them? Well, to get at that, we did surveys with about 3,000 voters across the congressional districts in the two years and asked them about their perceptions of the House candidates running in their offices. We asked them about the candidates' personalities. We asked them about who they were going to vote for and why they were planning to vote for the candidate that they, they had selected. And we asked them about whether the candidates, which candidate would best handle or how well the candidates could handle a variety of issues. Again, one of the ways that gender stereotyping has been seen to be disadvantageous to women is that voters are more likely to ascribe strength in dealing with national security, issues like that to men, but not to women. So, you know, like this, is, this presentation is getting boring, I realize. Oh, now it's really interesting. <laughs> Warning. Is that what we found is that for the most part, voters rated the candidates equally. Now, if you're looking up there and thinking that is the worst graph I've ever seen, don't worry, I'm gonna show you something in a minute. Um, what we asked people to do was to tell us how well the candidates in their district would be able to handle a whole series of issues. Gender equality, abortion, gay rights, health care, unemployment, crime, economy, immigration, national security, and the budget deficit. A whole variety of issues, some which are considered sort of women's issues, some are considered as stereotypically advantageous for men. We asked them to rate the candidates on a scale that ranged from they wouldn't handle this very well to they would handle it very well. We did this for Democrats and then for Republicans, for the Democratic candidate running in the district and the Republican candidate running in the district. And what I'm going to show you is just a series of graphs that demonstrates that there were very few differences in the way that voters perceived the candidates. These little dots, which I realize that for those of you in the back are kind of hard to see, are essentially the average placement for female candidates and their ability to handle these issues on this scale. And the, the white dots are for men. The little lines around them are what are known as confidence intervals. These are just a measure of the statistical uncertainty. And the story of that graph is that those dots are basically in the same place. There's small variation, but essentially voters rated men and women running for office in their districts as equally capable of handling a whole host of issues. The pattern for Republicans is a little bit different because Republicans are seen as differentially able to handle issues compared to Democrats, but there were no gender differences. 
When we looked at the, the candidates, um, the way that the um, uh, voters perceived the candidates' traits, we found the same thing. And when we asked them who they would vote for, we found that their decisions about who they were going to vote for were driven almost exclusively by their own party affiliation and their ideology. Which candidate was the candidate that shared their party affiliation? Had, very little, had nothing to do with whether the candidate was a man or a woman. So our conclusion from all of this is that it's very hard to find evidence in this wide swath of races covering two different election cycles that there is systematic that there are systematic differences in the way that women and men are covered or the way that voters perceive them. Now I want to underscore that doesn't mean that the campaign experiences that men and women have are the same. Women have to put up with things that men don't have to put up with. They have to deal with episodes of sexism that men do not. But the question is whether or not that translates into some systematic bias against their ability to win, and we don't find any evidence that that's true. But that hasn't answered the question that we posed at the beginning, which is if the media and the voters aren't to blame, why aren't there more women in office? And so in the last part of the talk, I want to just emphasize, I want to tell you what political science has identified about how we can figure out why it is that women are underrepresented. And it has to do with what's referred to as the gender gap in political ambition. And this essentially points to the fact that women are simply less likely to run for office than are men. Our research and other research that's been done finds that when women run, they win at the same rates as men. They are able to raise as much money as men. Voters are just as likely to cast ballots for them. Voters see them the same as they do as men. But women are simply less likely to run for office in the first place. And this contributes to women's underrepresentation because there's far more men who are running for office. One reason is because women are much less likely to call themselves qualified to run for office than our men. There's a level of confidence that men express about their ability to carry out a campaign that women do not. For those of you women in the office, you're sitting there going, yeah, I know, I have male friends, or I have a boyfriend, or a husband, or something. I know what he's talking about, right? Oh, sure, I can fix that toilet, you know? It was my father when I was growing up, and then, you know, like three hours later, there was water covering the bathroom floor. He wasn't allowed to try to fix the toilet after that. I'm going to show you some data from some surveys that my co-author Jennifer Lawless, along with Richard Fox, who's at, a, um, at Loyola Marymount University, conducted um, a few years ago. Uh, they conducted surveys with people in those pipeline professions that I described earlier, the law, business, uh, education, the kinds of professions that often are uh, launching pads to a career in politics. So these are men and women who have reached a significant level of career achievement and are well positioned to actually run for office. And they conducted surveys with them to find out if they could understand why women were less likely to run for office than are men. And so one of the things they asked uh, these, can these, um, these potential candidates, people who might actually be in a position to run, is do you think you're qualified to run for office? And what you can see here is if you look in the top line, the percentage of women and men in their sample that said that they were not at all qualified to run was significantly different. In fact, women were twice as likely to tell them that they were not qualified to run than were men. 12% of women said that they weren't qualified, whereas only 6% of men did. But if you look down at the bottom two rows, what you see is that men were far more likely to say that they're qualified and way more likely to say that they are very qualified. Men's and women's self-assessments of their capabilities are quite different when it comes to the perception of whether or not they could mount an effective campaign for political office. And this is one of the things that underlies this gender gap in political ambition. But it's not just women's own self-perceptions that are part of the source of this and their, their likelihood of saying that they're less qualified. It's also that women are less likely to be recruited to run, recruited by party leaders and activists and donors, the kinds of people who are typically involved in bringing in new candidates to the political process. 
When these uh, potential candidates were asked if they'd ever been recruited to run for office, the men were more likely. The gap among Democrats was smaller. So among Democrats in the sample, 48% of women and 54% of men said that at some point someone had approached them and suggested that they run for public office. But among Republicans, the gap was 13 points. 53% of Republican men said they had been recruited to run while only 40% of Republican women. And keep in mind, again, these are people in these pipeline professions. These are not just random people. These are people who might actually be in a position to run for office. I'll tell you a little story that, um, that is not a story, it's not a first-hand story. This is a story that my co-author, Jen Lawless, um, told me. She was doing interviews for this part of the research project. And on the same day, she interviewed two lawyers, one woman, one man. She interviewed a lawyer who was a woman in Boston. And she was doing an interview and she said, Had you ever, have you ever been recruited to run for office? And uh, the woman said, no, I never have. The interview goes on, there's talking, and the woman starts to tell a story about how the mayor of her small town, who was retiring, had recently told her, oh, you know what, you should maybe run for my seat when I retire. And Jen stopped her and said, well, I thought you told me you'd never been recruited to run for office. And the woman said, no, no, he wasn't serious. Right? Same day, several hours later, she's doing an interview with another potential candidate, a man. He's a lawyer from Detroit, I think. She says, have you ever been recruited to run for office? And he says, yeah, actually, actually, I, I, just last week I was. She said, oh, okay, well, tell me that story. He says, well, I was on a business trip, and I had a layover in O'Hare in Chicago, and I went to the bar, and MSNBC was on the TV, and I was like, making some comments about the, what they were talking about, and the bartender turned to me and said, hey, you know a lot about this stuff. You should run for office. <laughs> So, so even perceptions of what, just like reading the signals about whether or not someone has recruited you to run uh, appear to be different for men and women. And ultimately what this leads to is that women are simply less likely to consider running uh, or to actually run in the first place. When men, women and men in the study were asked whether they had ever, um, whether they had ever considered running, um, more than 50% of the women in the sample said that they had never thought about it, while it was only about 40% for men. Men were more likely to have considered it, to have said that they had seriously considered it, or to have actually run themselves. And so it's this. This gender gap in political ambition, the fact that women are less likely to run in the first place, that is really the most compelling explanation for why women continue to be underrepresented in political office in the United States. It's not what happens on the campaign trail. It's what happens before the campaign even begins. One thing to note is that over time, over the last couple of decades, the number of women running for office has increased. This is a graph that shows you uh, for each election cycle uh, since 1970, the number of female candidates for Congress. This is for both the House and the Senate. And what you can see is that this, this line, which is sort of the average, has gone up. Uh, this year, there's only about 180, down a little bit from the 210 or so that ran in 2014. But what's important to note about that is that there will be a total of about 800 candidates running for Congress this year only less than 200 of them will be women. Women will win at an equal rate, as will men. But because there are many fewer women running, we'll still end up with a Congress that is at best 21, 22% women. Now, what does this mean for thinking about boosting women's representation? I, I, don't, I don't have a silver bullet, and I'm not going to give you the answer, and you know, like then we'll just decide that this has been solved. Right? But I think there's three things that are maybe useful, both for the way that we think about and talk about women's underrepresentation, and I think also useful on a college campus um, where questions about politics and political participation and part civic engagement, which this forum is about, I think are really key. Um, one is to continue to do what I think has become more common, which is to denounce episodes of sexism that occur in politics. It's not okay for Donald Trump to say 
that Hillary Clinton would only be at 5% in the polls if she wasn't a woman. That's the only reason she's doing as well as she is. Somehow, I don't know what the logic is behind that, but that's something he said. Denouncing that, saying that that is not appropriate, that that's not fair, those are important things to do. But it is simultaneously critical to distinguish those episodes of sexism from whether or not there is systematic bias that will prevent women from winning. One of the things that Jen Lawless and I have found in our research is that the per that perceptions that women face systematic discrimination at the ballot box can lead them to believe that they are less qualified than they are. This is a story that is told in American politics, that is told in the media, for which the empirical evidence is lacking. When women run, they do just as well as men. But if women are told constantly, as well as when our party leaders are told that women are doing less well than women, men when they run, well, it's not surprising that fewer women are likely to want to enter the political fray. And that's connected to the next point, which is that one way in which women's representation can increase is if both political parties continue to encourage and recruit women to run. And the reason I note that both political parties have to do that is because the Democratic Party in recent years has made significant gains. About one third of the congressional delegation for the Democrats in Congress is women. You can see this in this graph here. That if you look at the period from 1920 through 1990, the Republicans and Democrats were basically the same. Very few women in their congressional delegations. But in the 1990s and 1992, which was the so-called year of the woman, when the Democrats put a large number of new female candidates in the House and the Senate, the numbers have only started to increase. For Democrats, it's about 33% of their caucus, but Republicans are only at 9%. And given that Republicans are going to hold, you know, roughly half, between 40 and 60% of Congress, right, in any given congressional session, that means that Republicans having a largely male-dominated congressional delegation is going to hold down the numbers of women who are represented in the legislature. So when I say that both parties need to recruit and encourage women to run, that is also related to this issue about perceptions that I mentioned. Party leaders, activists, donors often have the misperception that women are not as likely to do as well on the campaign trail and that it makes them less likely to seek out women to run. That perception needs to be corrected because if that is corrected, then both parties will be more likely to engage in active efforts to reach out to qualified women who will run and who will win. And then finally, the, this last point, which is that um, a lot of research has demonstrated that the gender gap in political ambition is actually established by the time young men and women get to college. That is, already in college, there, is different, there are different levels of interest for men and women in wanting to run for office. And I think part of that, of course, is because growing up, many people hear that politics is an old boys club or that that's something that is a man's job or it's something that's suitable for men but not women. I don't think those statements are overt, but I think that there is a subtle way in which that gets communicated. And I think that, of course, likely lowers young women's political ambition. And it is up to all of us to try to erode those perceptions. This brings us back to Hillary Clinton. Of all the things that Clinton's election could do, I think that that is one of the key ones, which it could shatter the impression that the presidency is a man's job so that it sends a signal to all of us, but including the future generations of political candidates, that if you're a woman, if you run, you have just as good a chance of winning uh, as does a man. So with that, I'll stop and I'll look forward to the comments from our distinguished panel. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. It's a whole lot of numbers you brought up on that screen. So now we're going to move into the more interactive part of the night part where we get to hear from people that will offer a perspective from their own experience.
from the local experience, what they see every day, what they've gone through, what they've been through. We have four panelists from very broad and diverse parts of society, and I'm so proud and honored that they've agreed to join us this evening. Ladies, please join me as I call your name and take a seat at your place. Marie Cusick is State Impact Pennsylvania reporter for WITF. Lois Herr. <laughs> Lois Herr is a former candidate for public office. <laughs> Madison Ponce is a student journalist at George Washington University. And last but not least, we have Barb Wilson, Vice President for Lancaster City Council. So each of our panelists will offer three minutes, three minutes, in terms of what uh, you feel about Dr. Hayes' presentation. And if you could please give us a, a, a local perspective of the topic. I guess Marie can start. Thank you. Is this on? Can, ever, can everyone hear me? No. no. Hello? Okay. Can everyone hear me now? All right. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Hayes. I, I thought that was a really interesting presentation. I am a member of the media. I work for WITF. It's the NPR station in Harrisburg. And I cover the natural gas industry. So you may have heard about the fracking boom in Pennsylvania. That's what I focus much of my time on. Uh, but I also cover Harrisburg and the, the policies that affect the oil and gas industry, environmental issues. Um, so, you know, I just want to say, first of all, that as we talk about the media, I think it's important to point out that we don't all huddle every morning and discuss uh, the stories we're going to pursue or how we're going to cover something. I think what I've seen a lot, um, especially this election year, is people pointing the finger at the media for, for portraying something this way or that way. I mean, we're all individuals and we bring our own perspectives and lives to the stories we cover. So certainly there is a herd mentality um, and a lot of outlets cover the same story and a story can kind of catch fire. But we certainly don't all get together and uh, decide to cover something one way or the other. Um, but I just looked up Harrisburg uh, because I thought um, you know, I didn't actually know all the stats on where we ranked, so um, I guess, you know, in terms of women's participation in our state government, we rank about 40th out of 50 states, and um, so I, I guess we're not doing too well. Um, but I also covered the, the oil and gas industry that's heavily male, very, a very white male industry. Um, and I guess, you know, one anecdote I'll just give is I was out in Pittsburgh a couple weeks ago covering a big natural gas industry conference. And the Speaker of the House, Mike Terzai, was talking about you know, the politics of oil and gas. And he said to everybody, you do know this is a contact sport. You know, this is, it's tough. And, and I think that perhaps maybe that's one of the reasons women don't always want to get involved um, in politics. It, it, can, it can get really tough. Um, and as a reporter, I know covering it's a very controversial issue, and I hear a lot of angry comments from people. I get a lot of pushback. And um, so it's perhaps it's not always an environment that women are excited to be a part of. Even if you can win, do you really want to be down there? <laughs> um, so I guess, yeah, that's just my perspective. And I think another big story out of Harrisburg that you may have heard of recently in talking about politics being an old boys club, I don't know if folks have heard about the Porngate scandal, <laughs> where a lot of um, state public officials were swapping pornography on their state computers. I mean, I think that really says something just also, not only that you do that, but you feel that sense of entitlement that you can do that on your public work computer. And, and just real quickly, the anecdote of one of the uh, cabinet level officials who had to, was fired after um, he was outed in that. He was 
actually pretty creepy with a, a, a female reporter I know. So it wasn't really surprising to me that he was named in, in, as part of the Porngate scandal. So I think just, you know, politics is a contact sport and it's, it can be a tough environment. And maybe even if you could win as a woman, it's not always the most desirable place to be. Good evening, and thank you to the League of Women Voters, and uh, thank you, Fran, and thank you, Dean Umbel, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I am currently an elected official. I'm Lancaster City Councilwoman, and I have been on council since 2011, and I think that um, Dr. Hayes brings up some really good points. For me personally, it wasn't, it's not the fact that I'm now in council and doing the work. I mean, that's, that I don't see, that's not the problem. The problem for me was campaigning and taking that initial step to say, yes, I will run for office because just like you said, it was like, well, I don't think I'm qualified. Why are you asking me? And, um, but on the, on the local level for city council, you know, um, races come down to a lot of money, especially as you move her further up the, the line in state and federal races. So on the local level, I didn't have to worry about raising a lot of money because we just were boots on the ground, knocking on doors, getting our names out there, and that was part of the campaigning. Um, but what I'm finding is, you know, at, at entering my second term, my first year, my second term, four-year term, you know, what happens with me next? You know, this is a part-time position. It's $8,000 a year, so you're really just really giving your civic duty. But, you know, I have a full-time job that I do at Franklin and Marshall College, so, but I do like this political um, career that I'm in, but my, my, my dilemma is what happens next? Because the next level, um, then you start to run into where you have to, when you campaign, you need a lot of money in the United States to become, to run for office on that higher level. And so for, I wanna talk a little bit about um, running for office and campaigning as a black woman. And I went in and did some research. Um, I went and found a, a research uh, report that the Center for American Women in Politics did, and I, I thought this really resonated for, for me. And it says that um, black women are among the country's most politically active citizens. In 2012, black women held the highest, had the highest rate of voter turnout of any group, mm -hmm. and they represented almost 60% of black votes um, and who went to the to polls. Um, however, that brings to the forefront that despite this growing power, black women electoral heft is not translating, translating into political representation. And so while you know, we're out here and we're pushing for the vote and we're voting and we're active in ways, <coughs> black women still are not even as highly represented as white women, which is the numbers are low there. Um, the other thing is, going back to the money, you know, we often represent districts and constituents who don't have that political clout to be able to give us the funds that we need to, f to, f to fight against an incumbent. Typically women who are fighting, uh, running for an open seat, you're more likely to win. But in Pennsylvania and Lancaster, you have a lot of people, typically white men, who have been in these seats and, who, and don't plan on going anywhere and, and have the backs, backers of unions and, and big corporations and, and what have you behind them. So to even think about running against uh, someone like that is, is a daunting task. So for me personally, it brings, I'm at that, pretty much at that level of what do I do next? Do I continue to be a career local councilwoman or do I try to push that, that gap and, and fight my way, um, boots on the ground, trying to fight my way into uh, the genre of something that's been steadfast, especially in Lancaster County, you know, there are, we have county commissioners, I, I believe there's uh, four of them, and it's, it's just, you know, you go and you talk about that to someone, because when I first started out my political career, I was like, I talked to everybody about every, every position, and I, it didn't matter, and they were like, oh, you don't want to run for this, and you know, that's the, the county commissioners, that's the Republican, that just, the county's Republican, and three of those seats stay Republican, and there's one Democrat, and we really like him, so why would you run against him, you know, and I thought, oh, isn't this a democracy, and are we <laughs> supposed to do this and challenge people? So, um, just to say that it, it's, it really comes down to campaigning and whether or not you feel as though you're qualified and, and, and you have the clout and the money because, you know, we all know that once women get in there and do the work, we're bipartisan, we're part, we're not, we don't 
we don't do partisan politics. We're bi we go through across the threshold because we want to get answers and we want to get solutions because we really care about the issues that we're facing in this country and our cities and our towns and what have you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So when I, uh, and one of, the, one of the things I want to just end with is when I was um, running for um, city council the first time, um, I, there was a women's group who held a forum for all of us candidates so that people could get to know us. And, and one thing that stuck with me and still resonates with me to this day is when a woman said that, you know, the hardest thing was when you're out there campaigning, it's like the biggest job interview that you'll ever have in your life because you're interviewing every day with hundreds of people that you're vying for this job, this position. And so um, when women think about that and you think about why do I want to do this, yes, I do care, but it's just easier for me not to put myself out there and, and have someone criticize me about whatever because I don't think I'm qualified or just, you know, not that I'm not. I, even if I think I'm qualified, it's just you're putting yourself out there and, and men are much more, um, as, as you mentioned, your father said, oh, I can fix that. You know, men are much more, oh, well, of course, I can be your councilman and, you know, and, and will put themselves out there whether they, and, and think they're qualified, whether they're qualified or not. And so um, it's one of those things where I will just keep asking the good questions and hope that young women um, as yourselves listen to people like me and also get advice from women who have been out there. I really appreciate um, Lois Herr who has ran for office, who's been in office. You know, people like that have to reach back and, and encourage women and so I try to do that every day with young women and um, I just want to continue to fight the good fight for women, all women and especially young women. Thank you. So as I sat listening to Dr. Hayes' presentation, and even while I was reading the book, I found that I couldn't see myself in it. And the women who I represent as a social justice change agent, as an advocate in my community. And I'm glad that um, Barb mentioned the fact that black women really have it hard in terms of getting into the arena. And so women of color generally have it hard. I also believe that on a grassroots level, we have a responsibility to build up women who have the potential to, to be leaders. You don't need a JD to run for public office. So long as you believe in something within your local community and you're representing a demographic of folks who feel that they're voiceless, that they have no one standing up for them. You have suddenly become a leader in your community. And that makes you capable then of standing up and saying, yes, I do want to run. On the other side of that is that as women, professional working women especially, we're not supporting one another. We are not standing by one another and saying, you know, I think you have the potential to do this. And I want to do whatever I can, along with my other professional working friends or even caregivers. We're going to do whatever we can to support you so that you will pursue this. And I think that's, that is one of the biggest stumbling blocks. Because once you have people who believe in you, you're capable of doing most anything. I really hope that the young women in the room are, are, are paying attention because the women who are 50 years and older, we need you to take the baton. We need you to finally say that, that you're going to do something within your local community. Don't leave it for someone else to do. We have to do it. I had a successful business career and was in my 60s before I fell in love with politics. Um, but you can fall in love at any age. <laughs> so you may find yourself someday, somebody just flows a switch and says, how about politics? And 
you know, we talked about why people might not run, but why women do run, I can only tell you, I think in looking back, I ran because it was an adventure. I ran just because it was there and I could do it. I ran because I cared about particular issues and causes, and it was an opportunity for leadership. Um, I didn't think about the sexist part of it, and actually, I was so in love with the process. I loved being a candidate. And therefore, if there was sexism out there, I actually didn't see it. I don't think there was any in the media coverage. I don't think there was much, and you pointed out to me when we talked before that although I was compared to Nancy Pelosi, so were some of the men Democrats running. So I think I did, you know, I don't think there was much out there, but we are blind sometimes to things we don't want to see. I don't think it was a problem in, in um, my performance, but it was an issue when I started in 2004, and there's a time gap between 2004 and 2010, issues. I was really leery about talking about abortion and gay marriage in 2004. By 2010, I was out front with both of them, supporting gay marriage and also uh, talking about my stand on abortion. I learned there was no benefit in waffling. But back in 2004, it was the choice of issues that may have been a little different there. Um, now what I see, well, now that I've looked at other people's campaigns and looked back at mine and dealt with the political establishment, there is institutional sexism in the party structures. And I've worked with and communicated with women across the state who are running for office. And if there's one thing they really need that doesn't cost money, it's a little attention. And the party does not pay much attention to women who go in and say, I want to run. And part of that is because of the push-pull theory. And I have a friend who's a sociologist for corporations, and I think the same thing applies. Men are pulled into the process. Whether it's a mentor or the courses they take or whatever it is, they get pulled into the process. If women want to be in the process and want to run for office, quite often they are pushing to get in. Ask or not ask is another question. I would wonder how many women really were asked or if it was just all of a sudden somebody brought something up and you saw it as a possibility and you leapt, leapt on it. Um, because nobody had to pull me. Nobody was there to pull me, but I sure was pushing. And I see that happening a lot. I have lobbied the party to set up a, some sort of organization to help women get elected. The fact that there are no women in Congress from the uh, state of Pennsylvania right now would tell me that the political parties have a job to do, particularly the Democrats who fuss a lot about gender balance. Um, we use gender balance all over the place, except in who we elect. Um, there's also the, the factor of being a novelty. I was a novelty when I ran. Um, Arianna Strader ran after me, and now Christina Hartman is running. And nobody, but nobody, is making any comment about, gee, it's strange to have a woman out there. I think that is a good point, that you you get over the novelty phase. Demographics and geography make a difference too. And when I read the book, I was imagining the women that I know who run from New York and New Jersey and major metropolitan areas. It's different here. And there may be some sexism in the actual voting decision, but I don't think that's within the realm of testing it. It's more difficult in rural America and areas like this um, for all candidates to reach out, but particularly, I think, for women. And that's where the party can help and the people who are the leaders who need to be supportive. And it's partly money, but part of it's just attention. Uh, because the women who are running need that for moral support, and they need that in order to get, reach out to people. They get the hints from the people who've been there before. Um, mentoring is very important. I think that's changing, but we still have to lobby for that kind of attention. But I see it changing because right now, Christina is on Emily's list and she's got the support of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee in Washington. And these people are coming around. So I'm encouraged that it's going to change. I think the points he made are absolutely true. 
except for the fact that there was one here where I have a note down, uh, don't blame the victim. Uh, <laughs> the idea that we are less likely to feel qualified, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes that's not our fault. So we have to not take this as a guilt trip in the sense that we, we're not running because we don't feel we can. Sometimes there really are barriers to our getting into the process. Once we're in, you know, go for it. Uh, and I think those barriers will disappear. But it's, it's a fascinating thing. And if there's one thing I want to tell the young people who want to run, do it. Uh, I used to think you had to be a little older. I don't necessarily think that anymore. We need a, a diversity of ages in the governing groups that, that are, are making decisions for us. So don't wait till you're 60 like I did. I wish I'd started decades before that. Hi. So I am actually still in college, so I'm giving that millennial perspective on this. Um, I am a senior at the George Washington University. I actually had Professor Hayes my freshman year in my intro to American politics class, which is, I know there was like 300 of us, so. So, very so, she, so, she <laughs> so I'm studying political communication, but I'm also studying women's gender and sexuality studies. I'm really interested in where those two overlap. and. I started back in high school with politics. I actually kind of just chanced into it. Um, my mom happened to meet with a woman who was running for the Pennsylvania State House. And she came home and she said, she is wonderful, you're gonna love her, you have to meet her. And I thought, okay, why not? Like, I'm a senior in high school, it's 2012, and I need some sort of career guidance here. And so I met with her, her name was Marcy Dubroff, and she didn't actually win, she was running against Ryan Allman, uh, and I got involved with her campaign. I was immediately hooked. But I think that that really exemplifies what Dr. Hayes was saying about how if you don't get in there in high school, you're probably not going to get in there. You know, unfortunately, I've seen that a great deal in college. And so now I'm actually an intern at the Democratic National Committee in the Community Engagement Department. So I do have to say that I'm here speaking on my personal uh, experiences, not in any official way or speaking for the party. But I see there are so many female interns and so many of our supervisors are women and even our interim chair right now, Donna Brazil, who is so cool, so brilliant, so powerful. And you know she's a very powerful woman leading a big organization. And so I've seen the good and the bad, really. I've seen the women in my classes who, when someone says, a professor or a guest speaker says, who here wants to run for office? And I see all of the male hands shoot right up immediately, no doubt, because I think, even if I don't really want to, why wouldn't I say I want to? Why not? I'm not locked in here. And then I see my female colleagues and classmate, classmates who sort of look at each other for a second and get that validation from each other. And then they raise their hands. And the problem is that I've seen those women make brilliant points, powerful points in class. And I think that they would be amazing politicians. But I've really noticed that difference in my classes. Uh, I also think that so much good can come from women supporting other women, like so many of us are saying, because that validation in class really comes from each other, right? The boy, the boys, men, I guess now, I still feel like I'm 13. Um, <laughs> but the men in class, they raise their hands without looking at each other. But when I look over at my female classmates and we kind of nod and raise our hands, that validation really gives us the power to move forward together. And so I think so much of the idea of, I know it can be kind of a buzzword that alienates some people, but feminism is important. Supporting other women is important. And I think that this idea of girls supporting girls, women supporting women, that's where it's all gonna come from. You know, it's hard to be 21, I'm 21 years old, and look towards the future and say, you know, I do wanna run for office because I think that there are so many challenges that we see from the time we're young. But I also think that when other women mentors like Marcy Dubroff or even my supervisors at the DNC or, you know, just female professors in the polycom department, they've encouraged me so much uh, and that has helped so much. So I really do think that it comes from young women supporting other young women, older women supporting us, and then also just sometimes you have to raise your hand, you have to say, yeah, why not try it? I think that a great example of this idea of am I qualified, that question, it was my decision to be on this panel or not. I got this offer, I was incredibly honored, but I thought, what, like, what do I have to say, you know? Why am I qualified? And I had to 
stop that opinion from taking hold in me. I had to say, no, like you're just as qualified as any other 21 year old woman. You are very interested in politics. You have something to say that's of worth. And I think that we need to tell each other that we have things to say that are of worth and that are good for this country and good for Lancaster and Pennsylvania and the United States. And so if we all really take that role of in classes, in office, in jobs, I know that I think that women can really help each other do that from the ground up. Do you want to say? <laughs> Go ahead. You're on. Yeah, so mainly what I want to say is, is thank you all for your extremely thoughtful comments. That was, um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to engage, and I think everything that you guys said um, is on point. Even the, even the comments that are critical of some of the arguments that I made and the, and the comment about blaming the victim is an absolutely right um, thing to note. I mean, I think that Jen and I both want to be careful about how we make the argument about these perceptions that might lead women to, to say that they're not qualified. Um, we, and I think we probably, in the book, art articulate it better than I can from the, the stage, um, but that uh, those perceptions are not born of women's own, own fault in some way. These are born of societal messages uh, that women receive. And so I think this is part of why we think that it's so important that we both call sexism out when it occurs and also make clear that that sexism does not necessarily translate into um, an electoral disadvantage for women because that helps feed those misperceptions that not only women might have, but also, as I said, the people who run the parties. And I think the, 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 um, uh, the point you made about the networks and um, the, the, the deliberative nature of communication among women it can be a really valuable asset. And I think that that's the organizations that have helped women, um, that have done a lot to recruit and train women uh, to run for office. Um, uh, those are the ones that have been really successful in part because I think they're, they're uh, taking uh, the approach that you're suggesting. So again, thank you all uh, very much. I really appreciate the engagement and it's a real honor to have your, your comments and thoughts. And I wrote them all down, so I'll take them home and, and relay them to Jen. <laughs>